In 1971, in the basement of the psychology department of Stanford University, a mock prison was created. It rivaled all social psychology experiments in controversy. Shortly after I finished this Stanford prison study, Milgram embraced me and said, I'm so happy that you did this. He said, he said because now you can take off some of the heat that, that he's had to bear a load of having done the most unethical study. Although this experiment is over 30 years old, its enduring power has been underscored by the events at Abu Ghraib. When we got to Abu Ghraib, it was eerie. People were being told to rough up Iraqis that wouldn't cooperate. I mean, they're torturing, they're abusing detainees. You're looking at this, the situation thinking, they've condoned this, but why? And if it wouldn't have been for those photos, no one would have ever believed what was going on over there. When I first saw the pictures, and immediately a sense of familiarity struck me because I knew that I had been there before. I'd been in this type of situation. I knew what was going on in my mind. The photographs were strikingly familiar to the photographs that we had taken, many of the photographs I had taken in the prison study. We didn't do any of the stuff that you see in Abu Ghraib where they, you know, get into a big pile or something like that. But I certainly subjected them to all kinds of humiliations. I don't know where I would have stopped myself. Given enough time, we could have got there. When the images of the abuse and torture in Abu Ghraib were revealed, immediately the military went on the defensive saying, it's a few bad apples. When we see somebody doing bad things, we assume they're bad people to begin with. But what we know in our study is there are a set of social psychological variables that can make ordinary people do things they never could imagine doing. At Abu Ghraib, ordinary people perpetrated extraordinary abuses. To understand why, it helps to reach back to the lessons of Zimbardo's experiment, how people respond to a cruel environment without clear rules. I think he and everybody else who came down into that situation got caught up into that situation. And the sense that this was an experiment, that began to fade away. It became just life. We frankly didn't anticipate what was going to happen. And we tried to really test the power of the environment to change and transform otherwise normal people, much as Milgram had changed or transformed otherwise normal people in an obedient situation, we wanted to do it in a prison-like situation. Over 70 men volunteered for Zimbardo's experiment. And they completed a battery of psychological tests. We picked two dozen, 24, who were the most normal and most healthy. Half are gonna be guards, half are gonna be prisoners. And it's like flipping a coin, and heads, this one's a guard, this one's a prisoner. So at the beginning, there's no difference in the kinds of people who are in your two groups. When we were given our jobs as uh, guards, we were issued a uniform, which was a plain sort of khaki uh, or lighter colored uniform. And then we gave them the symbols of power, uh, handcuffs, a whistle, a big billy club. And then the other thing we gave them were silver reflecting sunglasses. When you have mirror sunglasses on, then nobody can see your eyeballs. I think that any time you put on what essentially is a mask and you mask your identity, then it allows you to behave in ways that you would not behave if you didn't have the mask on. To make it more realistic, I had arranged with this Palo Alto Police Department to make mock arrests. When I was arrested, it was a surprise to me. I didn't think I was gonna be brought to an actual police station. I didn't think I was gonna go through a booking process. The guards then put a blindfold on them, stripped them naked, and then they put them in dresses, smocks with no underpants. Each had a number that replaced their name. They had to know the number. And they, they could only be referred to by that number. And they had a chain on one foot, which was put there to remind them at all times of their loss of freedom. So all of these things produces a sense of being dehumanized. 
on the first day, I said, this is not going to work. I mean, the guards felt awkward giving orders, and they'd say, okay, line up, repeat your numbers, and the prisoners start giggling. Hey, I don't want anybody laughing. Three, two, one. And then a very interesting thing happened. Dave Eshelman, who the prisoner's named John Wayne, like he's a Wild West cowboy, he begins to be more extreme. I decided that I would become the worst most uh, intimidating, uh, cruel prison guard that I could possibly be. I was sort of fascinated myself that people were believing the act, and I was trying to see how far I could take it before somebody would say, okay, that's enough, stop. We did have to do things like push-ups. Uh, we would have to sing things. At the beginning, we protested some of the actions. We did things to irritate the guards. So the guards' authority was challenged right off the bat. And the guards had to decide how they were going to handle that. And they had to decide it without our input. I mean, again, this was not a Milgram study in which we were standing over them telling them what to do. And they began to see the prisoners' behavior as a kind of an affront to their authority. And they began to push back. We would ramp up the general harassment, just sort of crank it up a bit. Nobody was telling me I shouldn't be doing this. The professor is the authority here. You know, he's the prison warden. He's not stopping me. This is unbelievable. They took our clothes. Hands off the door. There was the first evening a kind of rebellion that took place. The prisoners rebelled. They barricaded themselves in their cells and said, we refuse to come out. They took off their numbers. They didn't want to be de-individuated. They started cursing the guards to their face. And the key, the key turning point was the guards began to think of them as dangerous prisoners. And so the guards formulated a plan, used fire extinguishers, took the doors down, dragged the prisoners out, stripped them naked, and essentially broke the rebellion in a purely physical way. From that point on, the study was as remarkable a series of events as I've ever seen. It was, it was a real laboratory for Zimbardo and I to watch human nature transformed in a very rapid way uh, in the face of a very powerful situation. People really suffered. I mean, guards did terrible things to the prisoners. They punished them by putting them in solitary confinement, which was a small closet. You could squat or stand, but you know you couldn't sit, uh, and it was dark and, and uh, dank, actually. Every hour, every day, there's a teeny little bit more of an increment. And they're stepping up, taunting the prisoners. They're stepping up, the Count's not letting them sleep. They're stepping I don't think from one minute to the next, the people who are in it see the change and see the difference. And then the next key thing happened beside the rebellion, Prison 8612. He was the first one to have an emotional breakdown. I feel really fucked up inside. You don't know. I gotta go. I to a doctor, anything. I mean, Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside. Don't you know? I fucked up. I don't know how to explain it. I'm all fucked up inside. Help it out! At the time, if you had questioned me about the effect I was having, I would say, well, you know, they must be, they must be a wimp. They're weak or they're faking. Because I wouldn't have believed that what I was doing could actually cause somebody to have a nervous breakdown. It was just us sort of getting our jollies with it. You know, let's, let's be like puppeteers here. Let's make these people do things. What if I told you to get down in that floor? And fuck the floor. What would you do then? The guards now began to escalate their use of power. Some of them had prisons clean out toilet bowls with their bare hands. They now taunt, humiliate, degrade the prisoners in front of each other, and they exert arbitrary control over the prisoners. They keep thinking of more and more unusual things to do, and very soon after the fourth day, things begin to turn sexual. You be the bride of Frankenstein, and you be Frankenstein. I want you to walk over here like Frankenstein and say that you love the man. If you want to fully sort of humiliate somebody, then you want to get them in, the, in those things that they're, the, where their biggest fears are. And a lot of us have a lot of sexual hang-ups, and so that was part of that effort to humiliate them even get further. Up, get up, bro. I love you, too. 
You smile to an athlete. You get down here and do ten push-ups. The guards knew that had the coin come up heads rather than tails, they would have had the dress on rather than the uniform on. They knew that. So they certainly knew that the prisoners who were being mistreated had done nothing wrong to deserve the mistreatment. And yet the roles themselves were so powerful and the environment itself was so powerful that they ended up punishing those prisoners as though they had done something wrong. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. We were told to chant something about how he was a bad prisoner. And at the time I went along with it, I'm thinking, what does this matter? We don't believe this, but we can go along and chant it. That night he had a breakdown. Every day after that, another prisoner broke down in a similar way, broke down. I mean, extreme stress reaction. And we released another one on one on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Nobody who was in that study could deny that the prisoner breakdowns were genuine. They were. They were scary to see, they were upsetting to us, we, they were unexpected, but they were, they were very clearly the real thing. At some level we understood that something was happening that we were no longer in control of. It was damaging people, we didn't quite have a grasp on what to do about it. One of the mistakes we made was that we, didn't, we hadn't built in time to step back and to look at what was happening and call it what it was, which was mistreatment. We were caught up in the events that were that were taking place. Oh, you can keep your blankets, and 416 will stay in another day. We got three against one. Keep your blanket, 416, you're going to be in there for a while. So just get used to it. On the fifth day of the study, Zimbardo invited his girlfriend, recent psychology graduate, Christina Maslak, to visit the mock prison. I had heard bits and pieces uh, from Phil uh, about what was going on. And then when I was down there that evening, it really was kind of a wow. The thing that really got to me was when some of the guards took the prisoners down the hall to the men's room. She looks out and sees a line of prisoners with paper bags over their heads, each one holding the other one's shoulder. And they're leading them down the hall. And Phil comes over and I, look, look, you know, my God, look at that. And I looked up and something about it just, you know, again, it was the dehumanizing, demeaning kind of treatment. I just, I couldn't watch it. And she said, it's terrible what you're doing to those boys. And she got tears in her eyes. I said, what? And she runs out. And I'm, and I'm furious, I'm saying, you know, I'm saying, look, this is, you know, I run outside, we have this big argument. I'm saying, look, this is, this is dynamics of human behavior. Look, it's fascinating, the power of the situation. All the, so I'm giving her all the psychological basis and what kind of psychologist are you? You don't appreciate this. Um, and she said, I don't understand. You're a stranger to me. I don't understand this. How could you not see what I see? I mean, you know, you're a caring, compassionate person. I know you from all of these other things. Something's gone wrong here. And then the next thing she said, which had an equally big impact, is, uh, you know, I'm not sure I want to, you know, have anything to do with you if this is the real you. And that was like a slap in the face because what she was saying is, you've changed. You know, the power of the situation has transformed you from, from the person I thought I knew to this person that I don't know. And at that moment, I said, wow, you're right. We got to end it. After only six days, Dr. Zimbardo shut down his experiment. <laughs>